Amen. Well, uh, this will wrap up the mornings, and then we'll have one more night tonight. And uh, it's been awesome already. And I'm expecting for it to just continue to uh, just be anything above we could, we could ask or think. Amen. And so um, uh, Pastor Barkley left extra books that we didn't know. Did most of you get books on your table, uh, Pastor Barkley? Well, there's more books. I guess there was a couple more cases uh, left in our vehicle that uh, there'll be more things and we'll let you know how that's going to be where you can take more material. Uh, He wanted to sew uh, material into that. And uh, when I took him back to the uh, airport last night, they realized there was uh, three more crates uh, that needed to be. So uh, we'll get, make sure those get out uh, anyway. All right, doc, you ready? ready. Amen. Give him a hand as he comes on. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Well, Come on, birthday girl, and greet the people, and please leave me some time. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. <laughs> Thank you, Julius. God bless y'all. Um, won't it be wonderful there, having no burdens to bear, no clocks, no calendars, <laughs> Joyously singing with heart bells a ringing. Oh, won't it be wonderful there? Now, those of you that weren't raised in church and don't know those old songs, we had a good time. And we sang songs that made everybody happy. And I'm telling you, we may be singing some of them still in heaven. Hallelujah. Well, I've already read this morning Psalm 139 out loud to myself. And uh, Terry served me coffee. And uh, we went to, we had a, we have a great song that we play all the time in our room, uh, getting ready. And we've probably prayed it just in the last uh, couple of months, uh, maybe almost a thousand times, Pastor. (laughs) You know, and it's called, it's from the Brooklyn Tabernacle Choir, Psalm 34. And I'm, oh my goodness. Were they? From a flower shop here. Oh my goodness, thank you. So here's flowers on your birthday. Oh, everybody, I love flowers of any kind. Thank it you. Does. Oh, it's a presentation. Thank you. Oh, get a picture, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Trump. So, uh, amen. We'll set them over here yeah. and let you look at them as you have. That'll be awesome. Thank you. That is much appreciated. I love flowers. I'm always looking, I'm, I'm always going online and looking at places that have flowers and different websites that show beautiful flowers because the Lord made gorgeous that stuff, you know? And he made it to bless us, to give us something to make our eye gate happy, <laughs> you know, to look at the beauty. One thing have I desired and that will I seek after, you know, to, that I may behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. I tell him all the time, Lord, you're, I just love the beauty. Everything about you is beautiful, and I appreciate it. But I just wanted to say Psalm 139, uh, reading it out loud to yourself, you become the preacher. And it, the Holy Ghost gets on your voice. And you be able, you're able to, as you read that, uh, that you realize uh, God's plan for your life. Psalm 139, I read it all the time. I confess parts of it. And it, I just, as I am led by the Spirit of God, it says, Lord, I want to praise you and thank you for the awful wonder of my birth. And uh, I just think that's what some of the greatest vocabulary, you know, to just thank God that you were born. And uh, I, I always send my mother flowers on my birthday, thanking her. Uh, for the awful wonder of my birth, and that it says that you were formed in the darkness of the of, of the earth in a, a place of mystery, and I just think, oh my goodness, no wonder I is that my phone? It's Jesus the calling. <laughs> he wanted to wish me happy birthday. Uh, it wasn't. It wasn't. Correct. Expect the Lord. <laughs> Uh, but, I, you know, I don't want to take any more time. Um, I just want everybody to know how grateful I am for the life of God. 
we have such a high class life. We live high. We, you know, we don't have to take drugs. We already live high. Our names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Uh, we're, we're just escorted by supernatural angels uh, that take care of us. The, the power and life of God lives in us. And uh, even on your darkest day, which I'm sure there have been many, and will be some more probably in the future, but I'm telling you, we, we can pick ourselves up, dust ourselves off, and realize that I have the life of God in me. Sing it with me. I have the life of God in me. I have his power, his wisdom, and his ability. I have the life of God in me. Now, if you get it, you're having a bad day, make Make yourself dance and sing it. You know, I have the life of God in me. Move, you know, make your body move. I have the life of God in me. I have his power, his wisdom, and his ability. I have the life of God in me. You know, it, encourage yourself in the Lord. Read Psalm 139. The enemy always wants to make you small and devalued and, and, and think low thoughts, but think high thoughts. Get into the Word of God. Read Psalm 139. Realize your value in the earth, that God can't do stuff without you. And right now in this day and time that we live in, it's all hands on deck. Everybody's got a job. Do it. Do your job. Start in prayer. If you don't feel like you're doing anything, go pray and set yourself up and be say, I, I work from home. I work in the largest communication system in the universe. You know, and just, you know, you don't have to tell people, oh, I stay home and pray. No, you know, we're in it. Okay, it's all yours. Bye. Praise the Lord. Amen. Praise God. Well, today is frustration day. The last service. I've got this much time and this much information, so that's always a frustration, but praise the Lord. You know, I... I uh, I've got three sets of notes for living to give. I've got I've got my my notes that are called living to give. Then I've got my notes called living to give short version, and then I've got my notes called living to give short short version. That I try to, you know, depending on where I'm at and how much time I've got. One guy heard me one day say that, and he said, "Terry, Terry, I've heard you preach all three versions. None of them are short." But, uh, um, you know, li living to give is such a well, at Brother Copeland's this in, in August, I don't know if any of y'all were at Southwest Believers, but at Brother Copeland's meeting this year in August, Jerry Savelle was up speaking, and Renee and I were on the front row, and, and of course, Jerry, we go way, way, way back. In fact, Carol and, Carol and Savelle and Renee went to school together as girls and were raised in the same church and so on and so forth. And, and, uh, uh, and Jerry was, uh, I don't know if he was preaching or taking up the offering. I, don't, I forget what he was doing. <clears throat> and he just looked over at me and he said, Terry, I remember all these years and years you have preached living to give. And he just went on with his, whatever he was talking about. And uh, my office just got inundated after that saying, what was Jerry Savelle talking about? What's living to give? Do y'all have that? Do y'all have that? And uh, so my office started calling me and saying, uh, we're getting all these phone calls. And I said, well, you know, we've got the series. And they said, no, we don't. And I said, we don't. You know, sometimes you hire staff over the years and they come and go and somebody has an idea. They don't bother to run it by the boss. I tell them every now and then, I said, this is Terry Mize Ministries. I'm Terry Mize. You ought to, you ought to talk to me, you know. But somebody decides over the years, ah, we don't need that anymore. That's old. And so I found out we don't have it anymore. We don't have living to give anymore. And so uh, we had so many people would call my friends calling me and asking me and then people calling the office and asking them. So I said, you know, I've got to find some place where I can go and do like a four day meeting or something and preach living to give and get that back on on uh, recorded so we can get it out to people because it is an absolute game changing life changing uh, lifestyle of that we live to give. We're on this planet to be a blessing, to live, to love, to care, to share, to embrace, to minister. Uh, that's what we're here for. We, we didn't come, you know, it's like this meeting here. I didn't come to take anything from you missionaries. I came to add something to you. Isn't that right? When I go overseas, I don't go to take something from them. I come to say, take, I go to take something to them. Uh, numbers of times overseas, I've had people bring me all kind of uh, 
expensive stuff to give me. And I said, yeah, I didn't come for that. I remember being in the jungles of Burma uh, decades ago, and they brought me big old rocks of jade like this, you know. And they said, Brother Terry, would you like to have this? It seemed like Americans like this stuff. And I said, oh, no, I didn't come take something from you. I came to add something to you. And so I've never taken any of that. So it'd be all right if I did, be, be okay. I mean, the Bible says you can you know, give offerings to the man of God but, or for preaching or whatever. But I just always uh, uh, show them that I didn't come here to take something from you. Amen. I came, I came here to add something to you. And uh, I, I didn't come here to, 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 like I said yesterday, I said, every time I get in, uh, I said, y'all don't start looking at meetings as places to get money. That's the wrong motive. And, and anytime I get an invitation from Ken Harbaugh, I know I'm not getting money when I get there. I mean, I'm going to get money. He's going to give me an offering when I leave. But, but I, I give so much more than that while I'm here that I've, I've never left here in the, in the black. I've always left here in the, in the red, in the natural, and in the black, in the spirit. Amen. And same way with Mark. We were laughing about it last night. You know, I told Mark, I said, I told the guys this morning, I said, you and I never, never leave here with, uh, <laughs> you know, with, a, with up here. We always, we always doing this. And so it, it, it's our absolute lifestyle as a Christian because our father is a giver. He so loved the world he gave and he invented the system. And because he invented the system, we can tap into it. And I'm just shocked the church doesn't do it. I'm just shocked that the church will manipulate and con and cheat and lie and carry on and try to try to do anything to get people to give them money when when the, the when the way to get money is to give it. Man, if you want tomatoes, you, you know, I show you my tomato pack every now and then. I showed you yesterday. If you want tomatoes, you got to plant tomato seeds. And I, I go all over the world and show people this little package here. And I can go in the jungles and have. I can go in the deserts and have. I can go in the little bitty villages and have and, and show them this package. And, and, of course, I could show them packages of okra, but they wouldn't know what that is. So I show everybody around the world what a tomato is. So I can hold this up, and they know what it is, and talk to them about prosperity about seed time and harvest if you want to get you know you can take a tomato and sit it up here on this on this podium and just smash it and there'll be seeds everywhere and I can gather up all those seeds and literally I can count those seeds you can you can count the seeds in a tomato but you can't count the tomatoes in one seed amen and if we and if we are dumb enough, I told you Oral Roberts told me one day was at dinner and he said Terry Christians are the stupidest people on the face of the planet and I said Brother Oral, why would you say that? And he said, because Christians are the only people on the face of the planet that eat their seed. And nobody else does that. Only Christians eat their seed. And then they don't have anything left. And then they say, God, give me, give me, help me, help me, help me. And, uh, we, and, and I've lived in jungles and, and I've lived with tribes. I've lived with tribes that don't wear clothes. And I've watched them plant. I've watched them. T- I, mean, I mean, in the jungle, they take a sharp pointed stick, Guinea, and, uh, and they take a bag of corn seed and they start walking. They don't have straight roads like you have in Ohio. They just walk and poke a hole, drop a seed, step on it with the bare foot. Poke a hole, drop a seed, step on it with the bare foot. They come to a big old tree like this, they just go around it. You know, come to a big rock, they go around it. I mean, their roads aren't straight, but it's not long until there's a stalk of corn. And when I was first in Panama as an 18-year-old kid living with this particular Indian tribe, those stalks would grow, I mean, it'd be, they'd be this high. And, uh, you know, we say in the States, we say knee high by the 4th of July, man, they're shot up because of the tropics. And they'd have six ears to a stalk. And, uh, and I'd watch them and they'd separate it. They'd say, all right, this is our seed corn. We don't touch that. And they'd go put it away and they'd put tarps over it and, and they'd keep animals and rats and stuff away from it and keep the weather away from it. And then they'd have another section that we're going to eat. This is our bread. See, God said, I'll give bread to the eater and I'll give seed to the sower. And every time we get money in, I told the guys yesterday uh, while you ladies were uh, having tea, I told the guys yesterday, I said, now every time I get money in, every time I get seed in, I say to the Lord, what of this is seed and what of this is bread? Because I'm going to eat the bread. I'm not going to sow the bread. I'm going to eat the bread. God said, I give bread to the eater and I give seed to the sower. So I'm not going to eat my seed and I'm not going to sow my bread. And so when the money comes in, I say, Lord, tell me how much of this is seed and how much of this is bread. What do you want me to use for me? And what do you want me to use for seed? 
And then that tribal people, they'd separate in three piles. They'd have their seed corn, they'd have their eating corn, and then they'd have the ones they're going to put in a canoe and go seven hours up the river into the city and, and barter it and trade it and, and sell it and so on and so forth. And they wouldn't dare eat their seed. No matter how hungry they got, no matter how tough times got, they would not touch their seed because they know if they eat their seed, there's not going to be a harvest. And surely we're that smart. Surely we can figure that out. Surely we can figure out we don't eat our seed. And we don't con and we don't cheat and we don't lie and we don't manipulate. You know, missions is that, is that blanket word that everybody throws some, their, their stuff under thinking it'll get them some money. I've got a, I've got a, man, of, a, a, a man that's been a friend of mine. Renee knows who I'm talking about. Been a friend of mine since I was just a teenager and a great preacher. One of the greatest silver-tongued orators you'd ever want to hear preach. In fact, I taught him the word of faith. Uh, he, he used to tell me, he'd say, he'd say Terry, you know, uh, you're going to have to teach me this faith stuff. I, I, don't, I don't understand this faith stuff. And, and I'd say to him, I'd say, you know, you, you are a silver-tongued orator. Everybody wants to preach like you. I said, the only thing wrong with your sermons is you preach garbage. <laughs> But I said, you do it so well. You, you, you make people want garbage because you're such, a, you're such a, a speaker. You're such an orator. You're such a communicator. I said, but your sermons are garbage, man. And he was a pastor. And he said, Terry, I want you to come in my church every Tuesday night because we were, we were staying home for a while because Jackie's having a baby. And so we were staying home for a few, you know, for a few months. And uh, he said, I want you, while you're here, I want you to come in my church every Tuesday night and teach me this word of faith stuff. And I said, why? You don't believe it. He said, it's got to be right, though. It's got to be right. And I said, well, I give you honor for that. At least you're smart enough to know it's got to be right. And so I'd come in and preach every Tuesday night, word of faith. And David, he'd, get up, he'd, sit, he'd sit out there like you are with you. And he'd sit there and go. And his whole church is looking at him, you know. Now, I'm this young kid. You know, I'm 24, 5. And he's. And so Sunday, he'd come in to the pulpit and preach the most magnificent sermon. I mean, hermeneutics and homiletics and I mean it was and it was all tearing down what I'd preached on Tuesday night all the reasons why what I preached on Tuesday night wasn't right and he did it so well again it was good it was just garbage so I'd go to his office after service and I'd say pastor I'm done I said this is ridiculous I come in and preach on Tuesday night because you tell me to, and then you get up on Sunday and preach what I preached, what, what I preached was wrong. And I said, and you do it so much better than I do. You're such a better preacher. You're such a better orator. I said, there's just no sense in us continuing to do it. He said, no, no, I want you to keep on. I know this has got to be right. So I'd come in the next Tuesday night and preach the word, and he'd get up on Sunday, and, and he'd sit there on Tuesday night and go, and then he'd get up on Sunday and tell how it wasn't right. And we did this week after week after week. And I said, Pastor, I'm done. No, no, I want you here. You've got to preach. I've got to get this. <laughs> and finally, 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 he got it. Thank God. I said, if you ever, ever get this, you're going to be good. You know, because you just are so such a good preacher. But anyway, he said to me one day during all that nonsense, he said to me one day, he said, you know, Terry, he said, uh, he, he started traveling a little, just right after that, started doing traveling ministry. And he said, you know, I am so tired of having to preach in a church, travel and preach in a church every Sunday to pay my bills. And I said, well, that's the wrong motive in the first place. You shouldn't be, you shouldn't be preaching to pay your bills. You should be preaching to help people and you should be believing God for your bills. And, uh, and he said, well, I'm going to start having missions projects. And I said, well, you're not a missionary. I don't care. I'm, I, people give to missions, so I, I'm, I'm just going to come up with these missions projects all the time. And I said, then you're just a crook. You're just a thief. You're just a liar. You're just a con man. Are, are y'all here? And people just hide everything under the, under the guise of missions. And, and everybody says, I'm a missionary, I'm a missionary. And I tell them a lot of times, I say, no, you're not. 
No, you're not. But thank God for missionaries. And thank God for the real deal. And thank God for the word. But if we could just get a hold of living to give and understand that our source is almighty God. God is our source. The church isn't our source. Thank God for the church. I love it. My partners aren't my source. Thank God for my partners. I love them. I pray for them every day, every day, every day, every day, every day. But they're not my source. If they never give me another dime, I'm still going to make it. When I was a young man, I'd stand in churches and I'd say, now if you're, if you're sitting there wanting to, get, wanting to give the offerings going to keep Terry Myers from starving to death, just keep it in your pocket because I'm not starving. God's my source. Make some people mad. Make pastors mad. They say, don't say that. People won't give to you. I said, I don't care. Yeah. See, if you get so dependent on God that you'll get independent of people. Now, take it from an old guy that's done this for 54 years. I've watched missionaries. I've lived with missionaries. I've talked to missionaries. I love missionaries. But I've seen how they're messed up because of what they've been taught. It's like going overseas and you start teaching national pastors. And in and, and, and almost any country you go to, when you teach national pastors, they have one goal in life, and that's to get to America. And I tell them, America's not your source. America's not your sugar daddy. I said, you need to get your money the way I get my money. You know how I get my money? I pay my tithes and give offerings. That's how I get my money. I said, that's what you need to do. Hardly any, hardly any pastor in a foreign country, almost any country I've ever been to, hardly ever, ever, ever do you find a pastor that preaches on tithing because he's scared the people to leave. So you cheat. You, I said, Pastor, you're cheating your people. You're robbing your people. You've got to teach them to plant seed. If they don't plant seed, they're not going to get a harvest. But he lives to come to America. If I can just get to America, then I can meet two or three pastors and they can be my sugar daddy. And they write me letters. Oh, Brother Terry, will you be my father? Well, Sister Renee, will you be my mama Renee? And, hmm? Oh, my Lord, now that cell phones have come into being, gee whiz. Uh, there, there, there are countries that are just beggars. This may make some of you mad, but I, I tell missionaries all the time. I have pastors come to me all the time and say, Brother Terry, I, I got an invitation to Kenya. I said, who hasn't? I said, I've got a drawer full of them. You don't mind? That doesn't mean you're cool. That doesn't mean you're great. That doesn't mean you're a good preacher. It means they want your money. I said, you know, the three, the three worst countries in the world are Kenya, Ghana, and India. For begging. And I love Kenyans, I love Ghanaians, and I love Indians. And been to, been to those, pre, I've preached in those, preached and preached and preached and preached and preached. But I tell them, America's not your source. Don't call me and want me to bring you to the States. I refuse to bring you to the States. I'll come to you. That's, you know, I've had pastors in America that bring all the nationals over and pay their way. I said, don't do that. I said, I can take a tenth of the money you're spending on bringing them over. I can take a tenth of that money and I can go to them. I can reach more of them than you can bring over. And not make beggars out of them. Leave them with their dignity. (laughs) See, living to give is a lifestyle. You know, and it gets wild. Y'all see it get wild around here sometimes. You know, people say, I'll give this and I'll give this. Listen, I've done missions conventions all my life. I've had people give horses and cows. I've had them give land. I've had them give stocks and bonds. I've had them give jewelry. I've had them give cars. I've had them give motorcycles. I mean, they just get wild with it. It gets hilarious. It gets, you know. When I go in, now I do some missions conferences where pastors say, I want you to preach on missions, do a missions conference, but you can't raise any money. I said, well, well, then that's not a missions conference. I said, I'll, I'll preach on missions for you. And I've never raised a dime for myself, born face ever. Not, not once ever in 54 years have I ever taken an offering from me. Now I've taken a many an offering, but I've taken it for the church, the local church, the pastor, what the church is doing, or for missions or for missionary. Never in my life, Renee can tell you, she's known me 48 years this month. I've never, and I used to preach in her and her husband Dean's church 
several times a year. Never in my life have I taken an offering from me. You know, I've had a lot of pastors say, but Terry, you want, when you get to my church, you want to take your own offering? I say, no. Well, pastors, uh, preachers really want to do that. When they come here, some of them demand that they get to take their own offering. I say, well, look, look, I'm not coming for money. I'm going to come preach to your people. If you want me to have an offering, you receive it as the pastor. That you're the pastor, you receive it. And, and if you don't want me to have one, then don't receive it. That's up to you. It has nothing to do with me. I'm not, I'm not there for money. And don't get me wrong. I need money all the time. But I just have a different source. The church isn't my source. Amen. Yesterday I talked to you about Oral Roberts' book, Miracle of Seed Faith. I read in 1969. I was 19 years old. I was in the Army. didn't have any money at all. And uh, I was a tither and a giver, but I didn't expect God to bless me back for it because Mama told me not to and Pastor told me not to and the church told me not to. So I just gave my money in the offering plate and didn't pray over it, didn't expect anything back. And uh, I read Oral Roberts' book, Miracle of Seed Faith, and he said, number one, realize God's your source. He's your source of supply. He is your source. The air in your lungs is God's. The blood in your body is God's. Your kids are God's. Your husband's God's. Your, your wife's God's. Your house is God's. Your car's God's. Keep, keep a for sale sign in the glove compartment because God may tell you to give that thing away. Isn't that right? You know, um, I, t- I talked to you a lot about Brother Wayne Myers. I, I wish I had three or four hours to tell you all some really good stuff. Uh, but uh, Brother Wayne Myers is so known for giving cars away. Now, I've given a bunch away myself, but I hadn't scratched the surface of what Brother Wayne's done. And, uh, and so Brother Wayne has given so many cars away and, and supplies cars for pastors and, and, and indigenous pastors and, and national pastors and so on and so forth. And uh, one year he was in England. He was preaching in England. And he, and he got to telling some of these stories about telling some of these stories about giving cars away. And there was a, and there was a pastor there from South Africa. And so he was listening to Brother Wayne speak, and, and he, he left there and flying back to South Africa. He said to the Lord, he said, you know, Father, I'd, I'd like to be like Brother Myers and give some cards away. I don't know how to do that, but I ask you to help me do it. I want to give some cards away. And so when he got to the airport in, in, in Joburg, uh, he was driving away from the, from the airport to go home, and he passed a, 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 a lot, and it said car auction. So he just pulled in. He'd never been to a car auction before, didn't know anything about car auctions. And he went up there and said, how's this work? And they said, well, you just go around and look at these cars, and, and it's, it's private. You just, you just write a secret bid, uh, and then at the end of the day, we, we'll, we'll say who, who, who made the highest bid, who gets the car. He said, okay, so he bid on like six or seven cars. Didn't have any money. Didn't have the money to buy one. But he, he, he went around and bid on them, never thinking he'd get any of them and so at the end of the day he uh, he gets them all he was freaking out what am I going to do they're expecting me to walk up there and pay for these cars I ain't got any money and one of them was a Ford station wagon y'all remember when station wagons were alive and, uh, and so he went up to the auction guy and he said he said well I'm sure glad I got these cars and he said I'm going to I'll, I'll, we'll settle up here in, in a little bit. But he said, would you mind if I just drive this one just to see? The guy said, well, sure, go ahead. So we got in that Ford station wagon and drove down the road. Praying in tongues, man. Oh, Lord, you know, help. I got to go back and pay these guys. And so he drove down the road and he passed a garage that said, we pay cash for cars. So he pulled in there and said, what do you give me for this car? And they quoted him this really high price which was enough money for him to buy all the cars. So he sold it to him. He said, I'll be back in just two minutes and bring, you, bring it to you and bring you the title. Give me the cash. They gave him the cash. He went back to the auction, bought them all, paid for them all, took the guy of the Ford station wagon and went and gave all the others away. Did all that with no money, jump home. Because living to give is a lie. So you're in partnership with God. This isn't any more on how smart you are. This is now how smart God is. Amen. I used to tell people missions conferences, I say, go to your closet. If you haven't worn it in six months, you're not going to wear it. You got summer clothes, you got winter clothes. If you didn't wear this last summer, you didn't wear that last winter, give it away. Clean out your stuff. My first wife, Jackie, had a, all her life, 
she had a thing. I don't know where it came from, but she had a thing for diamonds. Loved diamonds. Thought diamonds were a girl's best friend. Of course, Josette, she never had one. She just grew up believing that. <clears throat> and when we got married, when we got engaged, I gave her a, a solitaire, a little old dinky thing. I think I paid $400 for it. It wasn't, you know, I, who knows what it was, a quarter of a carat or something. I don't know what it was. It's a pretty little diamond, but it, it, nothing to brag about. And, and oh, she loved that. Oh, man. Uh, she, and so we went to the mission fields and she had her, you know, and we came up to, to Lakewood Church, John Osteen's church in Houston, to his missions conference. Well, now John's going to suck your money right out of your pocket. And uh, so anytime, every year we'd go to his missions conference. So back in those days, Guinea would remember this. Uh, he always had Thanksgiving conventions over Thanksgiving. Missions conference. L later he turned it into just a preacher's conference. And I told him what I thought about that. And, and I, I said, you've gone from a missions conference just to a faith conference and a preacher's conference. Everybody and their dog has those. You're the best in the world about a missions conference. and You've screwed it up. You know, and, and so anyway, um, Jackie and I would come every year, spend Thanksgiving there. And, and if we had any, on the way to church at night, if we had any big bills, like a five, you know, <laughs> or, or, or a really big one, like a 10, or, or perchance a 20, wow, then we would stop, Tammy, at the store down the street, and I'd go and change them for ones. Because I know Brother John's going to take at least four offerings per service. At least four offerings per service. And I wanted to give in every one of them. So we'd change them to ones. And I mean, here come the offering plate. There's a dollar. He's, 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 he's taking up an offering for this missionary. There's a dollar. He, yeah, this one's a one, but we're going to give two dollars in this one. And this was our normal modus operandi. I mean, we did this every day. And, and, and then we'd be broke, had no credit cards, had no way to get any money, but somebody'd come and hand me money during the service. People, you know, I've always said my pockets grow money. Yeah. That's right. I've yeah, Renee knows that's true. My, my kids know it's true. My grandkids know it's true. They said, Papa's pockets grow money. Yeah. <laughs> my oldest son, who's now 50, has traveled with me all over the world, and I always made him in charge of the money. So we're in India or Africa or here or there, here or there, here or there. I'd always give Lynn the money every day. And I'd say, no, you, you can't. And when PDAs came out, then he would keep a, a record and keep the receipts and stuff. And so every morning we'd leave the hotel and he'd come over to my room and I'd say, I'd say, okay, here's, here's, all, here's, here's our money. Deal with the money today. And he'd say, Dad, where'd you get that? You gave me all your money yesterday. Yeah. I said, well, my pockets grow money. Yeah. So I'd give him every dime, every cent. And at the end of the, the, the night, we'd go to bed. The next morning he'd come over to my room and I'd say, here, take care of this cash. He'd say, where did you get that? You, you didn't have any money. I said, I know, my pockets grow money. You know, and so he just, you know, you, you just start believing that. Isn't that right? Yes, sir. And people give me money all the time. I'm just expecting, you know, I'm a, I'm a giver because of that I'm a receiver. When I go to the gas station, I say, I've got money around here somewhere. I go to the grocery store, hey, I've got a favor here. Somebody's going to give me some money. But I don't hint, I don't con, I don't cheat, I don't lie, I don't manipulate, right? I just go about my business. But anyway, uh, <laughs> I don't know what I was telling. Thank you, come to Lakewood. And so, so this one particular missions conference, uh, that's the one where we met? I met, Jackie and I met Dean and Renee at in 1974, the Thanksgiving Missions Conference at Lakewood. So Thanksgiving, we'll have known each other 48 years. And my hitchhiker story had just happened the month before. You know, I picked up a hitchhiker in Mexico, and, and he pulled a gun, stuck it in my ribs, said, I'm going to kill you. And I said, you can't kill me. I'm a man of God, and I've got authority over you in the name of Jesus. He shot at me five times as close as I am to Renee, and the bullets didn't hit me. Well, that had just happened the, the, the month before, and Brother Osteen had heard about it already. Somebody had told him about it. And so when I got there, then he said, uh, Terry Mize is here. Terry, come up here. You just had a situation in Mexico. Come tell us about it. And I thought, how did he know about it? I didn't even know he knew. But... Uh, a missionary had been in Mexico the night it happened, and, and Jackie told him about it because it, 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 it upset her. I mean, you know, she thought it, you know, her husband would have been dead. And so she's telling him about it. He leaves and comes to Houston, tells John Osteen. John Osteen leaves and goes to Tulsa and preaches at Raymond, tells it at Raymond. Brother Copeland happened to be in the service, and he heard it. He got started telling it on television. By the time I got back a month later, everybody knows this story. Yeah. And so Brother Osteen said, come up here and tell this story. And so I came up and told the story. And uh, Dean and Renee were Word of Faith people. 
Now, Brother Osteen was not a word of faith person at that time. He was charismatic, loved God, loved Brother Hagen, be it loved Brother Copeland or Savelle or, or any of us faith people. And he'd make fun of us and make fun of me and make fun of Dean and Renee. Good friend. I love John. And he, he later got converted and was a word of faith guy. But, uh, he, uh, but he would make fun of us. I'd come in from Mexico and he'd say, oh, praise the Lord. Terry Mize is here. My, 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 my. What if this was your son down there in Oaxaca, Mexico? Deep, dark Mexico. And, and, he'd, and, and he'd make this big deal. And so, you know, he'd say, Terry, this morning, I tell you, I became a faith man. Yeah. And anytime John said anything, the whole crowd just erupted. Yay. And so they're all clapping. They don't know why they're clapping. They just clap. And he said, and I'm just saying, uh oh, here it comes. And he said, I got up this morning and I looked in the mirror and I said, John Osteen. You're a faith man. So help me God. I'll never, I'll never, I'll never take an aspirin again as long as I live. And the whole crowd just, hey, they don't know why they're clapping. They clapping. <laughs> and I'm thinking, here it comes, here it comes, here it comes. And he said, no, from now on, I'm taking Tylenol. You know. <laughs> and, and, and he'd always gig me every time I'd come up to the, love me dearly. But he'd always gig me about faith. And, 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 uh, and I'd gig him back. And, and so uh, I can tell you several stories, but that clock back there is just, mm, mm, I hate clocks. And, uh, and so uh, this, this, this particular convention, Renee and Dean heard me tell the story. And I said two or three words, phrases during my telling that story about the hitchhiker shooting at me that they recognized as, quote, word of faith. I said a phrase like the integrity of the word of God. And they went, we know that phrase. Yeah. You know, that's a Copeland phrase. That's a, that's a Hagen phrase, you know. And uh, then I said something about I made a quality decision. They went, er, that's, that's, a, that's a word of faith phrase, you know. And so as soon as I got, as soon as the service was over, Dean and Renee came running over to Jackie and I and said, we know who you've been listening to. And, and we became fast friends that day. Went to their apartment that night and stayed till 3 a.m. Uh, talking and visiting. And, and, and so anyway, and so we've been fast friends ever since. And then Dean and Renee, Dean and Jackie ran off and left us, so we just got married. And so uh, <laughs> Brother, Copeland, Brother Copeland always tells me that, that Jackie left me for a better man, <laughs> you know, for Jesus. But um, anyway, so during that session, during that conference, this one night, we'd given everything we had. I mean, all the ones were gone. We had taken three or four or five offerings that night. Yes, it's gone. So I'm relieved. I mean, I can't give any more. So I'm just enjoying the service. And then Brother Osteen calls up a guy from Scotland. This guy had no more faith. I mean, this guy, I'd have slapped him upside the head if I'd have had the chance. He, I just didn't like him. Didn't like what he preached. Didn't like what he believed. Didn't like what he did. Didn't like anything. He's just a crook. Oh, he didn't like me either. And, 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 and he'd get up and cry. I've always said Americans are suckers for tears, for accents, and color of skin. I told John Osteen that and made him mad. I said, John, you're just a sucker like every other American for, for tears. Somebody come in here and cry, you think they're a good guy. You know. And he'd go, Terry. But anyway. And so he brings this guy from Scotland up there. Wasn't a faith guy of any way, shape, form, or fashion. And he stood up there and cried and cried and said he needed money. And, uh, and Brother Osteen said, oh, look at here, here's this. And he said, tell us what you do. And he said, and now, now, now me and another missionary, Bernie Davis, and I had just come back from Honduras, Tegucigalpa, Honduras. We had, they had just had this horrible hurricane that had killed 13,000 people. And so we waited a couple of months later and went in there with the crusade and had 25,000 people in the crowd. Blind eyes open, deaf ears unstopped, cripples walk. I was pulling people out of wheelchairs and off of deathbeds. And, and I mean, people running, I can see, I can see, I can hear. I mean, we had a, I mean, heaven bent low and kissed the earth and we got caught right in the middle of the smack. Well, John had us testify about that crusade and we did. And people clapped and got carried, you know, all these people got saved and, and miracles and stuff. And then he calls this clown up. And he gets up there in his Scottish brogue, which Americans love, you know. And he said, well, I cannot tell you stories like Brother Bernie and Brother Terry. But I've got a Bible school with seven students. Seven students. I'm teaching to be just like me. And I thought, oh, dear God, no. 
You're teaching seven people to be a beggar like you? And he said, I need a printing press to print the gospel. Well, man, I just didn't care. Man, little, 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 little. It, it didn't have any money anyway. I couldn't give to it, so I was, I, I was off the hook. Yeah. And Brother Osteen said, oh, we got to raise an offering. We got to buy a printing press for this guy to print, publish the gospel. And I'm just sitting there saying, mm, ha, ha, I don't have any money. And all of a sudden, I feel Jackie next to me just kind of shaking. I look at her, and she's crying. And I said, what's the matter, baby? And she said, I think, I think. I, I think God's telling me to give my engagement ring to him. <laughs> Boy, I just looked straight ahead. I thought, I'm not going to touch that. I knew I'm not going to touch that with a 10-foot pole. So I'm just sitting there watching all this stuff, you know, and Brother Osteen's going on about raising the money for this guy. And she's getting worse, you know. And so then she pokes me and she says, and I said, what is it? She said, do you, think, do you think it's God? Do you think, do you think it's God telling me to give my hand? And I said, well, it's not the devil. The devil doesn't want the printing press in Scotland. And she said, well, I'm going to do it. And this is big stuff for her, man. I mean, this is, this is the one and only diamond the girl's ever had. And so uh, she said, I'm going to do it. And I said, well, don't go up the middle aisle and let John see you, Brother Osteen. I said, because he'll make a big deal out of it. He'll say, oh, folks, look at here. My, 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 my. Here's this little missionary. Here's this little. These two are laughing because they know that's exactly the way John was. He'd do his hands. My, 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 my. Here, here's this missionary in darkened Mexico. And she's giving her engagement ring. I hit him made a big deal. And, and I said, don't let John know it. I said, we don't, we don't want people to know. I said, just go around the side and give it to the guy. And, and come back. And so she did. She went around the side and she gave the, her diamond ring to this joker and, uh, and, and comes back. And do you know that set her free? It absolutely changed her life. And I mean, after that, diamonds came and diamonds went and diamonds came and diamonds went. In fact, I started calling her Diamond Lil. I mean, I mean, diamonds and diamonds and diamonds and diamonds and diamonds came to that girl. Renee can tell you that's true. And she gave them away and gave them away and gave them away. And, uh, and, and I mean, I'd be preaching somewhere and somebody would come and give me some big old honking diamond, you know, and they'd say, we want you to give this to your wife. I said, no, I, I can build some churches with this. This can go into mint. No, this is for your wife. No, 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 no. I can, no, and Terry, this is for your wife. Yeah. <laughs> I was preaching for Joseph Prince in Singapore numbers of years ago. And, and Joseph stands up and he says, Brother Terry's about to preach for us. And he said, you know, Sister Jackie's not here with us today. But he said, her book, Supernatural Childbirth, has been such a blessing. And he said, we keep meticulous records. And he lit, list, listed off that all these babies that had been born supernaturally and women that couldn't have babies and read Jackie's book. And now they got babies. And he said, so today we're going to raise an offering for Sister Jackie. And I'm sitting on the front row and I said, oh, no, no, don't do that. <laughs> I, I'm on my way to Thailand and then I'm going to sneak into Burma illegally and pre. I, I can take that money. That, no, Terry, this is, Brother Terry, this is for, sister. no, 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 no. And he raised, I don't know, what, $14,000 or something and said, you take this back and give it to Jackie. I said, no, no. He said, you tell her this is for her. This is not for you. This is not for the ministry. She has to buy something just for her. And I said, Ugh. And so I took it back and gave it to her and said, Joseph says, you, you, you. And she went and bought herself a mink coat. I'm telling you, this living to give stuff is a big deal. God is not slack. And God is no man's debtor. Look at that mean old God telling that little old missionary girl never had a dime in her life. Take their only dime. Yeah, but look what happened. I mean, I've watched it and 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 I've watched it over and over and over again. I told you, Oral said in his book, three keys. Number one, you realize God's your source. You have got to settle that, that God is my source. Ken Harbaum is not my source. 
The lottery's not my source. The church is not my source. Meetings are not my source. Partners are not my source. America's not my source. God, Jehovah himself, El Shaddai, Jehovah Jireh, he is my source. You have to just, I mean, you need to tattoo that in your brain that God, Jehovah, is your source. I don't care who's around and who's not around. God's your source. Your newsletter is not your source. God's your source. And he said, and number two, you give first. He said, no farmer ever goes out to a field to harvest where he hasn't planted. You got to give to the field first. You can't go out there and say, give me corn and you never put any seed in the ground. You give first, you give first, you give first. And then thirdly, he said, you expect a miracle and you expect it from unexpected sources. Don't just expect it from your job. That your job is, is your reason. Is, is their, that's their reasonable service is to pay you for working. You work on your job. They give you money for that. They pay you for your services rendered. But that's not your source. You need to start expecting from unexpected sources. All right, Lord, I've planted, so I'm expecting. And you get your expector working. Yes. And he said, he said, you know, never give an offering. Oral said, never give an offering. Never pay your tithes that you don't lay hands on that and pray on it. Oral said to me one day at dinner, Ken, he said, we were sitting there in lunch in his dining room. And he said, Terry, I would not go to a church that stood up and took up an offering and didn't give me some scripture and tell me God had blessed me back for it. And I said, well, sounds right to me. So I said, I wouldn't go to a church <laughs> where they took up an offering and didn't give me some scripture and tell me God had blessed me back. And see, we're not giving the people the scripture as a con to get them to give. We're giving them the scripture so they can put their faith on something. Amen. Are y'all here? I know the clock's ticking. I've only had two enemies ever and just a clock in the calendar and they never stop. They never stop. Ken talked yesterday about Oswald J. Smith. I've talked about Oswald J. Smith all my life. He was a, he was a, a pastor in Canada. He loved, loved missions, wanted to do things for me. I can't tell Oswald J. Smith stories because there's just no time, but I, boy, what a, what a man of God. He was a pastor that said to his church, he said, every year we're going to give seven times more. Pastor, listen to me. We're going to give seven times more money to foreign missions every year than we spend at home. Whatever we spend at home during the year, we'll spend seven times that overseas. And he said, the day this church tells me not to do that, you get my resignation. And he pastored that church until he's an old man and died. But here's, what, here's something he said about missions. Now, the, the language is old, old English because this was way back. Um, but, but he said this. He said, uh, he said, there's four keys in missions giving. He said, number one, if I refuse to give anything to missions this year, I practically cast a ballot in favor of the recall of every missionary. If I sit here in this mission convention and I give nothing, then I'm saying I think every missionary already come off the field. Right? He said, if I give less than I did last year or in other years, then I favor the reduction of the missionary forces proportionate to my reduced contribution. So if I gave $100 last year and only give 50 this year, then I'm expecting 50% less from the missionary. Number three, if I give the same as I always have, then I favor holding the ground already won. But I oppose any forward movement. My song is hold the fort. Knowing full well that the Lord never intended his army to take refuge in a fort. His soldiers were always commanded to go. Number four, if I increase my offering beyond former years, if I increase it, then I favor an advanced movement in the conquest of new territory for Christ. Isn't that good? I gave that at a missions conference I was doing for Fred Price years ago. And from that day to this, they, they put this up on the screen every time they take up an offering, every service. Uh, because it, it's so powerful and so, so, so right. I don't remember. I'm, I, I, you know, I've, I have too. You know, passion for souls, the man God uses, the challenge for souls. All those. Well, you and I both read all those books, but I forget which one this came out of. But you're welcome to copy this. 
you, you, you know, you're welcome. Welcome. I, I can give it to your, one of your staff, and they can run, copy it and run it off. Or <clears throat> um, take a photo of it. Uh, the uh, here, I'll just give it to you right now, and you can take a photo of it or give it to you, your staff or whatever. Renee and I have a, have our own YouTube program or channel, and it comes out a new one every Thursday. So tomorrow's Thursday, there'll be a new one out tomorrow. And uh, I know I talked about that in one one session just recently, and, and we showed that on the screen. It was on the it was on the screen. But y'all ought to listen to our YouTube program if you like our ministry, because I'm not limited by the clock like I am here. We just tell miracles, and I mean it's only. 30 minutes program, but I mean week after week after week. Uh, I, I, we, we got on spiritual authority series and we got, I think, to part 22 and finally just took a break and started, started teaching something else. But you can learn a lot from those YouTube. And they're free. Just go to YouTube and type in Terry Mize Ministries and, and there's hundreds in the archives. You can go back and get them and tell them to tell us to preach and shut up and preach and shut up and preach and shut up. Uh, or, or you can just watch them currently every, every week. Uh, let me give you three scriptures real quickly here just so we can have some scripture for all this. But when Oral said give first, um, I don't know how I can impress on you how important that is. And he said, this is where most Christians miss it. Because he said, Christians are good people. They love God. They want to help the pastor. They want to help missions. They want to do something for people. But they don't have the money. And so they say, God, I want to help pastor. I want to help the missionary. So give me some money and I'll give it. And Oral said, God can't do that. He said, a farmer doesn't go to the field and say, give me a harvest and then I'll plant. He said, you got to plant first. You got to give first. So, so you all know these scriptures. I'll give you two Old Testaments and one New Testament just to, just to save time and get on with this. But in 1 Kings 17, starting at verse 8, you know the story about Elijah and the widow at Zarephath. You know, there was a famine in the land. It's not raining. People are moving out of town, moving over to Egypt, trying to go find some food. And, uh, and God says to the prophet, he said, well, go up here at the brook Cherith and just hang out there at the brook Cherith. I've commanded the ravens to feed you there. Drink out of the brook and, and I'll send you food uh, uh, every day. And so he went up there by the brook and here comes these. I, thought, I always thought it was kind of funny, uh, Jean-Paul, that God sent unclean birds. I mean, no Jew would have dared touch the raven, but here, here God's sending the raven uh, with food for the prophet, and he ate it and, uh, and drank out of the brook. And then one day the brook dried up. Notice, notice the birds didn't quit coming. The brook dried up. Always notice the supernatural doesn't ever dry up first. The natural dries up first. When you quit doing the natural, it stops the supernatural. Brother Hagen used to tell us the natural provides a platform for the supernatural. If you want God to do supernatural stuff, you need to do some natural stuff. Amen? Oh, I could tell you so many stories. Uh, uh, and so when the brook dried up, the Lord said, okay, go down to town. There's a widow woman there, and I have commanded her to sustain you. So here goes the prophet down to town and he sits at the well, and here comes this little widow woman. And, and she, she has already said, we know this already by reading the scripture, she said, I only have enough meal and enough oil for two cakes. And I'm going to go outside and get, Don, he, she said, I'm going to get two sticks. That's all she needed. She didn't need a big fire. She said, I'm going to get two sticks to build a fire. And I'm going to cook me a cake, and I'm going to cook my boy a cake, and we're going to eat it. She said, we're going to eat it and die. That's it. This is her last supper. Right? She's done. She's dead. Her boy's dead. Well, God knows all this. And so, here comes the prophet. He sits on the well. She comes out to get her two sticks. He sees her and says, excuse me, ma'am, would you get me a drink of water from the well, please? She said, well, certainly. And so she gave the prophet a, a drink. Give first. Right? And so uh, he said, uh, ma'am, would you make me a cake? And she said, sir, I can't. I've only got enough oil and enough meal. And I've come out here to get two sticks to make a fire. And I'm going to make a cake for me and my boy. And we're going to eat it and we're going to die. And that mean old prophet said, a lady, make me a cake first. Can you imagine ABC, NBC, CBS, Fox? Can you imagine... 
Prosperity preacher. Harassing widow woman for her last for her last food. See, in the natural, that looks really, really, really bad. But God's not a natural God. God's trying to get her to operate the laws of prosperity, trying to get her to operate the laws of giving and receiving, of sowing and reaping, of seed time and harvest, of living to give. And I think it's so sweet what the prophet said to her. He said, lady, make me a cake first and after. Well, David, now there's an after. There wasn't going to be an after. She and the boy is going to eat and die. But now he says, and after. You and your boy can eat. And lo and behold, she did it. She gave to God first. She gave to God first, gave to God first, gave to God first. And so the Bible says he just moved in with her. King James says for a season, if you look at the margin, it says for a whole year. Can you imagine ABC, CBS, NBC, Fox? Scandal. Prosperity preacher shacking up with a widow woman. Living in sin. Lived with her for a year. Now, the church... The church is so used to Hollywood. We're so ingrained and indoctrinated with Hollywood and special effects. You know, a few years ago, I was taking my grandsons. They're, they're this big now, but they were this big then. And, and, and I was taking them off down to South Texas to deer hunt. And I stopped at a Cracker Barrel and fed them some breakfast. And in Cracker Barrel, they've got little, little racks of old videos of stuff I watched when I was a boy. There's Rin Tin Tin and there's Lassie, you know, and, and stuff like that. Lone Ranger, you know. And I thought, oh, David, man, these, these guys are going nuts for this. So I bought several. Got in the van, took off. I stuck them in the, in the player, you know. And, 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 they're wa- and I'm driving and they're watching. And they said, Papa. And I said, well, God, do we have to watch this? <laughs> I said, hey, that's great. They said, no, it's awful. It's boring. Because, see, you know, there's no blood. Lone Ranger always shot the gun out of their hand. There's no brain splattering on the wall. It was boring to them. There's no special effects. And the church is that way with God. The church is used to special effects. The church is used to sensational and spectacular so they try to put God in a sensational and spectacular box. But God's not sensational, nor is he spectacular. He's miraculous. And he doesn't want your life to be, Jay, he does not want your life to be sensational, nor spectacular. He wants your life to be miraculous. God's a God of miracles. I told God decades ago, I said, you know, if I was you, uh, we lived in Tulsa. I said, I, I, if I was you, I'd tell Oral where the Ark of the Covenant is. I said, you know where it is. I mean, Indiana Jones found it. Surely you know where it is. And I said, and Oral could put it in the prayer tower. And, 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 and people could come from all over the world. And we could walk by, and there's the Ark of the Covenant. There's the Ten Commandments. There's the showbread. There's Aaron's rod that budded. See, that'd be sensational. That'd be spectacular. There'd be no doubt. But God doesn't want you to be convinced by natural things. He wants you to... God is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. He wants you to be a faith person and by faith believe that he is. Amen. I said, Lord, if I were you, man, I'd, I'd, show, I'd show folks where, the, where Pharaoh's army drowned in the Red Sea and they'd go dig up all those chariots and all that stuff. And Look how, look how great that would be for you. Right. The Lord said, 
Because he's not sensational. See, I've had people come to me and say, oh, Brother Jerry, we put a man on the moon. You know, back in what, 1969. We put a man on the moon. That's, 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 it's a miracle. I said, oh, no, 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 no. It's not a miracle. It's sensational. And it's spectacular. And I think it's great. But it's not a miracle. See, a miracle, let me give you my definition of a miracle. A miracle, by my definition, is because God. Because if you can explain it, it's not a miracle. Anything you can explain is not a miracle. But if it's just sensational or spectacular, that means we know how we did it and we can do it again. That's always not a miracle. We put a man on the moon. We know how we did that. We can do it again. It just took an expenditure of a few billion dollars and some intestinal fortitude as the men and women decided to get in that bird and fly to the moon and get in a Jeep and drive it around and pick up rocks. Right? And we know how we did that. We can do it again. My kids used to say, Dad, we finished our homework. It's a miracle. I said, oh, no, it's not a miracle. <laughs> it's sensational and it's spectacular. <laughs> but, but I know how you did it. And now that I found out you can do it, you're in trouble. Because <laughs> you're going to have to do it again. <laughs> but see, we, we, the church, when we read that story and all those other stories in the Bible, we immediately put our Hollywood brain and so we see this little woman giving him this cake and then him going home with her. And we see, Ken, we see that, that meal barrel and that oil. We just see it's just squirting all over the house. I mean, I mean, meals up to here. That didn't happen. If that had happened, her neighbors would have killed her for the food. They were hungry. They were starving. They'd, they'd have killed them for it. Here's what actually happened because it, God's a faith God and a miracle God. Every, every morning she had to get up and had a little bit of meal and a little bit of oil. And she made that profit a cake. And then she had enough to make her boy one and her one. At lunchtime, she had a little bit of oil and a little bit of meal and she made that profit a cake. Now I wasn't there, but I can tell you how it happened. That's, that's how a miraculous God operates. It's insensational. That she just didn't have a meal all over the house. She had to operate in faith every day. Every day, every day, every day, every day. And you know, if he lived with her for a year, like the margin of the Bible says she did, that's uh, 365 days. And if she made three cakes for breakfast and three cakes for lunch and three cakes for dinner, Joe said, that's nine cakes a day. And nine times 365 is 3,285 cakes. And she thought she had enough for two and she's going to die. But she gave to God first. Now remember, she's not a preacher. She doesn't have a newsletter. She doesn't have a TV show. She's not a missionary with a project. She's just a widow lady that was operating living to give. It was operating the laws and principles of God. Second Kings 4. There was a widow lady. Another, God likes widows. In fact, you better treat widows right and you better treat orphans right and you better treat kids right. I tell you what, this child trafficking garbage and this, this pedophilia garbage and all this nonsense that I don't have time to get on. But God says, if you treat little kids wrong, Abortion. God said, if you mistreat these little ones, it would be better for you, hotshot, if you had a millstone tied about your neck that weighed several thousand pounds and you cast into the ocean. Because God doesn't take kindness to that. You don't mistreat widows. You don't mistreat kids. There are just some laws of God that we, we, we need to get back to. You know, the LGBTQ folks are trying to put the letter P for pedophilia on the end of their little alphabet soup. And they want pedophilia to be legal. Over my dead body. Pedophilia, by definition, is sex with a child. By definition, a child can't consent to sex. And they're trying to make this legal. And, and, and we're all supposed to smile and say, well, yes, we're tolerant. 
We'll allow that. No, we won't allow that. I'll put you down. You can mess with the kid around me. Amen? It, it, it's insane. It's hellish. Well, I can't get on that. Gee whiz. And so, so this widow says to the prophet Elisha, she says, my husband's dead and we're in debt and we owe all this money. And, and, and in America, we don't have a debtor's prison, but they had a debtor's prison. You get in debt, there you go to jail. And they're going to take my sons and put them in prison. And that mean old preacher, Jake, that mean preacher, first thing out of his mouth is, lady, what do you got? Shame on him. Preacher's trying to get money out of a widow woman. No, he's trying to save her life. Just like the other preacher's trying to save her life. Trying to save her kids from going to jail. Lady, what have you got? I don't have anything. Lady, what have you got? I don't have anything. You got to have something God can multiply. Something. Something, anything. Anything God can multiply. Because if you give God nothing, he's going to multiply that too and give it back to you. It just won't pay the rent. She said, well, I've got a little oil. He said, that's enough. Just something to multiply. God's got to have something that you give him first to multiply. And so he said, that's, that's it. He said, listen, you go get all the pots you can. In fact, go out around the neighbors and borrow pots. And then send those boys out and get them borrowing pots and get them back in here and pour oil. And so they went and got all these pots and they were just sitting everywhere in the house. I mean, just everywhere. Inside, outside, wherever. And she had this little bitty bit of oil. It didn't just start squirting everywhere. It wasn't sensational. It wasn't spectacular. It was miraculous because she, she, and she poured that first pot and it got full. And she still had a little left. So she poured that pot and that pot and that. And she, she kept on. And when the, and when the natural ran out, when she ran out of pots, when there were no more pots, the oil stayed, it says. The supernatural stopped. She should have had those boys outside making pots. Isn't that right? The supernatural didn't run out until the natural did. And the prophet said, now go, go, go sell that and pay your bills. Amen. Then you know the story in the New Testament. In uh, John chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6, Mark, Luke, John. Anytime God tells you the same story in all four Gospels, he's really saying something to you. And there was a little boy at one of Jesus' meetings. And he had his lunch with him that Mama made that morning. And Jesus is preaching to 5,000 men besides the women and children, 15, 20,000 people. And uh, the disciples were tired. They're always getting tired. You got to watch the disciples. And uh, they, were, they were getting tired and, and, and they had probably heard Jesus preach this before. They were bored. He, Jesus preached this last place we were at. Yeah, I know, I know. I've heard him preach it three times now. Well, I'm hungry. I know, I'm hungry too. I wish he'd hush. I know, I wish he'd hush too. Can you imagine those guys want Jesus to hush? But they did. Finally, they said, well, let's, somebody tell them to go. Somebody tell them to hush. <laughs> Great, you do it. I'm not going to do it. Well, somebody needs to tell him. Peter might say, well, I told him last time. I'm, I'm not touching that. <laughs> and finally, somehow, Philip got chosen. Maybe they drew straws and Philip got the short straw. All right, Philip, you tell him. But listen, when you tell him, don't tell him we're hungry. He doesn't care about us. You tell him the kids are hungry. He loves little kids. You tell him the kids are hungry. So Philip goes up there and Jesus is preaching and taps him on the shoulder. What, Philip? I'm preaching. I know, Lord, that's what I want to talk to you about. Uh, you've been preaching a long time. <laughs> a really long time. And this is a desert place and there's no McDonald's out here. And uh, we, these people are hungry. You need to send them away so they can eat. Boy, Jesus looked at him with those coals of fire that he had for eyes. He said, all right, hot shot, feed them. Well, don't you know Philip said, oh, never mind, Lord, you just preach all you want to. I'll say that. No, 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 no. You said they're hungry. You said they're tired. You said I'm not taking care of them. Feed them. 
And what did Philip do? What did the apostle do? What did the disciple do? What did the great faith man do? It says he looked in the bag. Missionaries, don't look in the bag. Don't ever look in the bag. Philip looked in the bag and said, we can't do it. God tells you to do something, don't go look in the bag and say, we can't do it. God tells you to do something, say, yes, sir. And just start doing it. Just start pouring oil. And Philip looked in the bag. And he said, Lord, we can't do it. He said, 200 penny worth is not sufficient. That each of these should take a little. Did Jesus ask for a financial statement? (laughs) Did Jesus say, can we do this? Can you tell me how we can do this? Is it possible to do it? No, Jesus said, feed them. That was the order. And Philip's standing there just turning all kinds of shades of red and green and purple and wishing he could hide under a rock and didn't know how to get out of it. And he just standing there and Jesus is in his face. And Andrew walks up. Andrew must have been a nice guy. I've always said Andrew must have been the original charismatic. You know, he was just such a nice guy. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Isn't this wonderful? And so Andrew walks up and says, excuse me, master. There's a little boy over here. And I know you love children, so I know you won't be mean to him. Just pat him on the head and send him away. He's got this silly idea that he wants you to give you his lunch that mama made this morning to feed these folks. It's so sweet. He's so cute. Just pat him on the head. He'll be okay. And Jesus said, gentlemen, dinner is served. And he took that little boy's lunch and he took a fish and tore it in half. And the head grew a tail and the tail grew a head. And he tore that in half and the head grew a tail and the tail grew a head. And he tore that in half and the head grew a tail and the tail grew a head. I don't know how he did that. I just know he had a seafood restaurant in one hand and a bakery in the other. Ocean in one hand, barley field in the other. And the Bible says he fed all those folks. And the Bible says this. It says they ate as much as they would. It doesn't say they got a little bite. They weren't doing communion. They, no, no they, they ate. In fact, the Spanish Bible says they ate until they were stuffed. And then there were 12 baskets left over. Isn't that convenient? 12 baskets, one for each disciple. And the disciples didn't get it. How do you know they didn't get it? Well, because they got in the boat and started the other side. And Jesus said, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees. And they said, now he's mad because we didn't bring lunch. So they didn't have lunch with them. What happened to those 12 baskets? Whose food was it? It's the little boys. Jesus is no man's debtor. He didn't take that little boy's lunch and leave him without anything. I believe that little boy went home empty-handed, Guinea, and opened the door. Peter followed him with a basket of fish. Andrew followed him with a basket of bread. Bartholomew followed him with a basket of fish. Thomas just shaking his head, followed him with a basket of bread. (laughs) Judas followed him along, putting as much as he could in his pocket. You give first. You give first. That's, that, that's two Old Testament and one New Testament stories, and that's not all of them. That's just all that the lot of the, oh, I hate the clock. It's supernatural. None of these people were preachers. None of these people were missionaries with a project and a newsletter and a, and a video. These were just people. That locked into the laws of prosperity, the laws of seed time and harvest, the laws of giving and receiving, the laws of sowing and reaping, the law of living to give. And it worked for them. I think one of the greatest stories in the Bible is there in, <laughs> at the end, in the first Kings. And you know the story so well, the, 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 the little woman that never had a baby and her and her husband had property and Elijah and his servant Gehazi had passed by. And, and so one day she said, uh, let's, let's, let's make the man of God a, a, a bedroom, prophet's chambers. Y'all can't imagine how many pastors and how many friends and how many Christians tell me, we're, we're, we're making a prophet's chamber in, in our house. And I, and I always say, no, you're not. We certainly are, Brother Terry. I said, no, you're not. We certainly are. We're making a prophet's chambers. 
I said, no, you're not. I said, what you're making the guest room? I said, you're going to let anybody stay there. When your kids come home, they'll stay there. When your friends come, they'll stay there. That's not, that's not, that's not for the prophet. That's not for the man of God. This lady built it for the man of God. It wasn't just a guest room. And she put a bed in there, and she put a table, and she put a candlestick. And she told Elijah, Elisha, Elisha, every time you come by here, you spend the night here. That's your room. And so, you know the story they did. And one day, Elisha said to Gehazi, I said, what can we do for her? We need to bless her. God's no man's debtor. He's not going to take something and not bless it back. And Elisha said, well, you know, uh, let's ask her. They brought her in there and said, what can we do for you? She said, not a thing. What do you want? Not a thing. And I love this. He said to her, he said, would you like us to speak to the king for you? She said, no. No. I dwell among my own people. I don't need you to talk to the king. But keep that in mind. She said, I'll speak to the king for it. They said, I'll speak to the king. And so uh, she left and Elisha said to Gehazi, what, what can we do for her? He said, well, she didn't have a child. In those days, it was a curse not to have a son. He said, she didn't have a child. She didn't have a son. So he called her back in there and said, lady, this time next year, you're going to have a son. And so sure enough, she did. And then that kid got around 21 years old. You know the story. And he walked, worked in the field with his dad. And he grabbed his head and said, my head, my head. And he fell down. They carried him into his mom. And she held him and rocked him in her lap until he died. And she, she didn't get uptight about that. She just put him in that prophet's bed. Got the young man. She said, saddle up. Drive me to the man of God. She didn't go screaming out there and tell her husband, our baby's dead, our baby's dead, our baby's dead. And uh, none of us blame her if she did. But uh, she just took off. Her husband didn't even know what's going on. He said, hey, where are you going? She said, I'm going down to the man of God. I'm going to the mission convention. You, go, you going on a Tuesday morning, Wednesday morning? It's not the Sabbath. It's not a holy day. What are you going down there for? She said, it's It's well. It's well. Man, she took off. They drove. She told that young man, don't you spare the horses. You go. Unless I tell you to slow down, you go. And so Elijah's, Elisha saw her far off and said, that's that Shunammite woman. Something's troubling her, but I don't know what it is. I asked Brother Hagin one day many years ago, Ken. He, you know, every year he'd stand up at Raymond and deal with homosexuals and say, you, you homosexuals in here need to go home. Every, every year he did it. You, you don't belong here. I don't know why you're here. I don't know why you came, but you need, you need to go. And, uh, and so I asked him one day at dinner, was it dinner one day? And I said, Dad, you do that every year. He said, yeah. I said, I said if, if I was in sin, I said, the last place in the world I'd go is where the prophet is. Man, I wouldn't go around the prophet. I said, I can't believe they'd come to, they'd come to Ramah. And he's all oh, Terry. He said, it, it, he said that the ministry is one of the favorite places for homosexuals. He said, it's, he said, it's the one place they can hide. And nobody thinks anything about a, a preacher and a piano player uh, traveling together, sleeping in the same hotel room together, eating every meal together, being together all the time. He said, it's just the easiest place to hide. And I said, yeah, but I thought prophets knew, would know that. He said, oh, no, Terry, prophets don't know everything. And he, he gave me that scripture I'm just talking to you about just now. He said, Elisha didn't know what was wrong with her. He said, he was the prophet. But he said, I don't know what's wrong with her. He said, prophets don't know everything. He said, prophets just know what God shows them. Yes. And so anyway, he uh, uh, finally, Elisha said, go off down there and stop her. Something's wrong. Ask her if it's well with her husband, well with her, and well with her son. Well, I thought, that's dirty pool, man. That's cheating. That's almost like leading her into a trap. And so Gehazi goes off down there and says, stop, 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 stop. And she stops. He said, my boss wants to know, is it well with your husband? Is it well with you? Is it well with your son? Well, she didn't fall apart. I don't know, my son didn't. She said, it shall be well. Get out of my way. I didn't come talk to you. Boy, she goes to the prophet. Didn't tell him what was wrong. Never did tell him. She just fell down at his feet and grabbed his ankles and said, you're not going anywhere. So he's standing there with her around his ankle saying, it must be the boy. It's got to be the boy. So he said to Gehazi, I take my staff and go down there and lay my staff on that boy. And he said something really interesting here. He said, Gehazi, he said, as you go on the way and you run into some of your friends, he said, don't you speak to them. He said, if they salute you first and say, good morning, Gehazi, how you doing? He said, don't you answer them. 
He said, don't you speak to them first. Don't you say, good morning, how are you? He said, you see, when you're on a faith mission, you have got to be focused. You, you can't go coffee that off and fellowship that off. When God told you to do something, you need to lock into that thing and latch on to it. And so she didn't even go with Gehazi. She stayed with the prophet. So finally he thought, well, I might as well go too because I can't go anywhere. And so they got off down to her house and Gehazi's been laying the rod on the boy. Nothing's happening. And so uh, he went in the bedroom. And I can just see that woman getting her rocking chair and sitting right in front of the door and sitting down and saying, he's not getting out of that room without my boy. And sure enough, he raised him from the dead and came out and here's your boy. So you talk about a return on your investment. You talk about a, 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 a harvest off of your giving that prophet or prophet's chamber. And here's what I was going to tell you. I think this is so funny. My time is totally gone now. Uh, here, here's what I think is so, so funny about all that story is that the famine came and she left home like everybody else did. She just left her farm and went to Egypt and stayed for seven years. And seven years later, she came back, went out to her farm, and there's squatters on the farm. And she said, this is my farm. They said, nope, it's our farm. And they ran her off. So she goes down to talk to the king about it. And when she gets down there to the king, guess who's in the king's chambers talking to the king? It's Gehazi. And the king's saying to Gehazi, tell me some more stories that Elisha's done. Tell me some of those miracles. Tell me another one. So he starts, he tells her, well, you know what? There was this lady who didn't have a baby and she built a prophet's chamber. And we said, you know, you're going to have a baby this time next year. And that baby died and, and, and Elisha raised him from the dead and, and blah, 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 blah. And then walks that woman and Gehazi said, in fact, that's that woman right there. That's her. Now, remember all those 30 years ago, he said, would you like us to speak to the king? And here they are 30 years later. And the king said to that woman, is that true? She said, yes, sir. He said, well, what, what can I do for you? She said, well, I've been gone for seven years because of the drought. And I went back to my farm and there's squatters and they won't let me have it. And he said, Captain, you take you a company of troops out there and you kick them out and you give this woman her home back and all the, all the profit of everything they've made the last seven years. So see, her, her return just kept coming. Everybody say living to give. Living to give. I'm telling you, missionaries, if there's one thing, if there's one thing, if there's one thing I could, I could do for you would be to get this, this lifestyle, not a sermon, this lifestyle to you of living in order to give. You're here to bless. Now, you're doing that anyway in the foreign country you're in. You're, you're giving... You're, you're giving 24-7. You're giving 100%. But don't let the devil cheat you by convincing you, look, I'm, I'm, everything I'm doing is giving. I've left my home. I've left my family. I've left everything that's dear. I've come to a foreign country. I mean, I'm giving 100% 24 hours a day. But don't, don't let the devil cheat you out of giving and tithing. I've had missionaries say, well, I don't tithe and I don't give because I'm, I'm giving 100%. Yeah, but how's that working for you? Amen. Did y'all get anything out of all this? Yes. How many of you know I'm not through? Yeah. <laughs> Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you for these precious ones. Father, you know I'd wash their feet. I honor, respect. Thank you for their lives, their ministries. They've given their lives, given their families. Father, some of us have buried spouses and some of us have buried children. In this gospel, I've done that. And Father, I thank you for leading them, guiding them, directing them, and giving them revelation knowledge. Lord, you can do it in, in, in a split second more than I could do it in preaching and preaching and preaching and preaching and get across to them, living to give. Father, it radically changed my life when I read Oral's book, and then a few years later, it radically changed again when I ran into Wayne Myers in Mexico and saw that he wasn't doing, he wasn't just having a need and giving a seed and getting a harvest. He was actually living to give. And I thank you for it. The stories I could tell. And I thank you for it. I thank you, thank you, thank you. 
But Lord, I thank you there's no end of your supply. Heaven has no limits. Father, when I think of you giving them manna, I remember I did a study so many years ago, Father, that it took 4,500 tons of manna a day to feed those 2 million Jews. Over a 40-year period is 14,600 days, which is 65,700,000 tons of manna. And yet, if you'd have given it to them all the same day, it would have killed them. If you'd have dumped 65 million tons on their head the first day, they'd have died. But they had to learn to live a day at a time. A day at a time. A day at a time. Father, you gave them fresh baked bread from the bakeries, from the ovens of heaven. (laughs) Every day. And just because they've closed the bakeries down these days doesn't mean they took the ovens out. You still have the recipe for manna. There's not a missionary in here that you've lost their address. You know every heart. You know every circumstance. You know what you've told them to do. You know what it cost. And Father, you are El should I the all sufficient one the many breasted one our father our mother our provider the most high God the possessor of the heavens and the earth I thank you father I pray that this week has solidified what many of them knew already And then I pray that it's given revelation to those that didn't know it. And that they'll embrace living to give. It's a lifestyle, Father. It's a lifestyle. And I pray it gets born on the inside of them. And they'll see the supernatural. They'll see the impossible. They'll see the incredible. Because as I said last night, Father, if, if it costs them three or $4,000 to live, and yet that's all they're getting in, then they're not being as effective as they could. So then if they had another 1000 they could do $1,000 worth of good. If they had a 2000 they could do $2,000 worth of good. Father, pour on them the abundance so that they're not just surviving. They're not just scraping by. They're not just barely getting along, but there's an abundance And Father, I pray one last prayer. And this may sound really strange to people. But I pray one last prayer. The same thing I've prayed over me so many, many times. Because Father, I passed the poverty test. And I think most of these people have passed the poverty test. We've proved to you that we'll go with nothing. We've proved to you that poverty isn't going to stop us. But Father, I pray we don't fail the prosperity test. I've seen many a preacher that passed the poverty test, but failed the prosperity test. Because when you start blessing them and start blessing them and showing them how, how it works, they, they, they begin to go after filthy lucre. They begin to go after materialism instead of prosperity. And Father, we must know where our needs end and our greeds begin. Don't let us fail the prosperity test, Lord. Help us to use your money in your kingdom without bowing down to it. We don't serve mammon. We serve God. And I thank you for it. I pray blessings on them, spirit, soul, body, family, finances, home, and ministry. I pray for their children, Lord. I pray health upon them. That no evil befalls them, no plague comes nigh their dwelling. No plague, no plague, no plague, no plague, no plague, no plague. I don't care what medical science, what name medical science puts on it. I curse every plague. And I thank you for prospering them. Spirit, soul, body, family, finances, home, and ministry. In Jesus' name.
In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen, Amen, Amen. Pastor.